five, four, three, two, one. Hello, I'm Gavin Givanoni, Professor of Neurology at Bath's and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. And I'm going to be talking to you today about the customized management of individuals uh, using approved disease modifying therapies. Definition, the term customize is when you modify a treatment or a particular task for the individual. And that's where the crux of this matter is, is how do we use our current disease modifying therapies uh, for the individual. Taking one step back, let's go to the objective. Um, we set up this MS Brain Health uh, initiative, which was a policy initiative uh, about five years ago. And our overwhelming treatment aim was to prevent end organ damage. In other words, to spread the adoption of a therapeutic strategy that maximized lifelong brain health for every person with multiple sclerosis with the principle that time matters and that we should treat MS as effectively as possible early on so people can have a healthy brain when they get to old age to deal with cognitive impairment associated with aging. And the whole underlying principle is how do we intervene early and effectively to change the trajectory of the disease over time. And my personal opinion is I'm convinced we are doing this now. We can show with uh, various uh, data uh, that we are changing the natural history. And this is the first data set that was published, just showing you an epoch analysis, looking at people in different categories based on uh, the pre-DMT era, low efficacy and now high efficacy. And if you go to the pre-DMT era, you can see by the age of 65, over 80% of patients needed a walking stick. When you go to the low efficacy DMTs, these were really the injectable therapies, interferon beta and lutetium acetate. Uh, that figure now drops to around about 60%. And now in the high efficacy uh, era, the, uh, the figure is in the region of about 20 to 30%. So there's no doubt that by adopting this early effective treatment approach, uh, we're having a, a major impact on the uh, overall outcome. And this is not the only data set. Um, it's, this is seen in MS space, it's seen in the Swedish uh, data sets as well. So this is something to, uh, uh, to celebrate, to be honest with you. The problem, however, is, is how do you actually determine who's going to be a responder to these treatments or not? And yeah, we have 100 patients and I can't tell you who's going to be a responder or non-responder. Uh, apart from, in my opinion, anti-drug antibodies or neutralizing antibodies, there are no validated baseline predictors of who will be the DMT respond or non-responder. And I'm saying that is because neutralizing antibodies are a predictor of non-response uh, to treatment. And so it's a basically a statistical, it's a actuarial science. You see, if you take 100 patients and put them on tier one, a lower efficacy DMT, after four or five years, you'll find that there'll be about 20% response rate with 80% breaking through either clinically or subclinically. If you go to the next tier, you may take it up to 40 to 50%, but again, the majority of people will break through with uh, clinical or subclinical activity. In other words, on non-responders or suboptimal responders. And when you go to the high efficacy tier, the top tier, uh, and you re-baseline, say at six months in terms of setting your clock for the drug working, you get neurodent disease activity rates of around about 80%. So the question then is, it's a statistical question and it's like rolling a dice. Do you want to gamble on low or high efficacy and do you want to move through these tiers or go to the top tier immediately? And that is the real debate we are having in the field. Do we do the slow escalation or the rapid escalation or do we flip the pyramid? And it's all about benefit and risks when we're talking about individual patients. <clears throat> and so this is why we can't have a blanket rule for everybody. I personally prognosticate at baseline, uh, and this is just a table I use of the factors that have been shown to predict outcome at baseline. And I tot them up. Obviously not all of these will be available for everybody, but you give them a percentage of what you've got. And I can basically put patients into three categories uh, at baseline. Um, about a third of them will be in the poor prognostic category, where we know they will do badly unless managed more actively. About 30% will have a very good prognostic profile and will do relatively well, but the majority of patients are in between those extremes uh, and we have no idea. And this is why patient choice uh, or engaging them in uh, deciding on what treatment strategy to adopt is so important. Okay, and then you put this on these treatment strategies and you can see uh, we don't actually use the watchful waiting slow escalation or conventional step care approach anymore. We actually are using the rapid escalation where we 
that people help choose their therapy and we re-baseline them and we monitor them actively with annual MRI scans and if there are any breakthrough activity, we escalate quite rapidly. Or if they're in the more poor prognostic category, we would recommend flipping the pyramid and giving them the most uh, effective therapies uh, first line. In addition to this, our treatment uh, uh, ambitions are also changing and across the top, we're moving away from just suppressing relapses to try and render people free of disease activity, that's inflammatory disease activity. And now we're going beyond that, we're trying to normalize brain volume loss and we're trying to normalize neurofilament levels, either in spinal fluid or peripheral blood. So I think what's happening in the terms of the, the therapeutic strategies is not only is our treatment strategy evolving in terms of more active, more activity in terms of getting people disease under control, but we're also expanding our treatment target to try and be more active. And then layered onto that uh, on, the, on the left here is the disease activity categories, which are, are essentially what's in the uh, labels of the different drugs across the world. And in the European Union, for example, MS is classified as being inactive, active, highly active, or rapidly evolving severe. And I think for the sake of this um, uh, presentation, that's not really that important. What we're trying to do is make everybody inactive. And so if you have to categorize patients into poor, intermediate, good, or normal aging, and you know, we have a, a bell-shaped curve. What we're trying to do is by um, putting patients on DMTs, we're trying to shift the curve to the right. In other words, increase the proportion of patients with a good prognosis or normal aging. And this is uh, our ambition. In other words, reduce the proportion of patients that end up with a poor prognosis. In other words, end up disabled using a walking stick or a wheelchair. Are we achieving this? Uh, this is just an example of uh, real life data that's come out the uh, MS-based international uh, effort comparing disease modifying therapies to no treatment. And you can see in the top uh, left hand graph, no treatment versus the injectables, glutarum acetate interferon beta. It's quite clear that people on treatment do better in terms of uh, outcomes. Similarly, when you start moving to the more effective therapies, fingolimod, natalizumab, alemtuzumab, uh, the uh, response rates go up much, much higher. With uh, Now, that you've got to appreciate that this di uh, data would be biased because under the current uh, data collecting scheme, patients that are on more effective therapies tend to get their second or third line, or they have a worse prognosis and get their first, first line. So you've got to interpret the use of these agents based on how they are, are licensed in the uh, different countries. This particular outcome is secondary progressive MS, which is defined by the clinician entering the data. Uh, and that is a important milestone. Um, and uh, uh, there is little doubt that uh, treatments are having a, a major benefit in preventing or reducing the proportion of patients becoming secondary progressive. <clears throat> now, what about the early access to high efficacy DMTs? And this is another data set from uh, MS Space. Uh, and you can see that from commencement of high efficacy DMT in the top there, there's an enormous difference between those who get onto highly effective therapies, top tier uh, first, uh, early versus late. If you look from disease onset, in other words, people getting onto first line, again, an enormous bit of daylight between those who get onto it uh, early versus late. And then the last graph is uh, six years after disease onset, you see the daylight between the curves is now um, less. It's quite wide confidence intervals though. But I think the message here is early versus late. Uh, and so if you want to give your patient the individual and you want to customize it and you want to guarantee them the maximum response, uh, is little doubt in my mind, not only with this data set, but also the phase three trials of high efficacy versus a platform injectable therapy or an oral therapy, uh, early access uh, is what's important. Early access, not late access. So what is customized medicine? So it's not only about efficacy. So why I put this up is because there are people who, when you customize and potentially give them a high efficacy therapy, are gonna be exposed to serious adverse events. And then there's also the issue of personalized things like family pain in pregnancy, for example. And that's why safety comes into it. Um, uh, and we're always worried about the severe adverse event when we are customizing our treatment strategies for people with multiple sclerosis. There's lots we can do at, at baseline. And so this is just a slide illustrating various strategies we can use at baseline whilst we're using the therapy and in the individual drugs monitoring to de-risk them. In other words, to try and prevent the serious adverse events. 
and this has to now be DMT specific. Uh, this just summarizes all the strategies we have on the table. Uh, some of them are specific to certain therapies, but there is a lot we can do now to de-risk uh, these higher efficacy therapies, which makes it much more uh, palatable for the individual to try these treatments or go onto them uh, first line. Now, Luzumab, that's our first really high efficacy therapy that was licensed uh, way back in uh, 2007. And as you know, one of the main adverse events was progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, but there are other CNS infections that have emerged. Uh, and we now have a very good therapeutic uh, strategy uh, involving uh, uh, serology testing for the JC virus to de-risk this. And if you look on the uh, left in the middle graph, you can see quite clearly that the number of cases developing PML is dropping or plateauing out. So our therapeutic strategy of de-risking this is, is, is working. But again, there's other things with this, with this agent. There's anti-drug antibodies, infusion reactions, a potential CNS lymphoma risk. Uh, there's issues around pregnancy. There's issues around transitioning from uh, nalizumab to other therapies. So at the end of the day, if you are going to be working and prescribing these therapies, you have to have in-depth knowledge for each disease modifying therapy to truly customize it for your patients. Donald Rumsfeld is known for this uh, famous quote he made about known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And it's really important that we put in place systems that we pick up serious uh, adverse events that won't emerge in phase three or the post-marketing surveillance. And this is why we need population surveillance to pick up known unknowns, things that we know are gonna occur, or unknown unknowns, things that are rare and may not emerge uh, straight away. And this is an example of a known unknown that I predict will happen. Uh, as we know, anti-CD20 therapy, therapies stop germinal center uh, function. And by doing that, they prevent good quality antibody formation. And this is one of the reasons why people on anti-CD20 or B cell depleting therapies can't make uh, antibody responses to novel antigens. This is looking at uh, KLH, KL limpid hemocyanin, and you can see they're very blunted compared to uh, people on interferon or no DMT. And this has implications now in the COVID-19 pandemic because this is an example of a woman who developed swab positive COVID-19 while she was on ocrelizumab, a B-cell depleting agent. Despite making a full recovery, uh, when they tested her uh, for serology, she didn't seroconvert uh, and she has hypergammaglobulinemia. And so this has not only implications for obviously epidemiological seroprevalence studies around coronavirus, but about vaccine readiness. So we actually predict that patients on B cell depleting therapy won't respond to vaccines. So this is a really important issue going forward to consider in the current environment. Other vaccines that are our issue is uh, HPV vaccine, for example. A lot of our patients missed out on childhood vaccination. They want to cover themselves or upgrade themselves from uh, the quadrivalent to polyvalent. And you can see that if you're 15 years old, you need three doses. You need a zero, two, and six months. This is an issue if you want to uh, vaccinate patients before going on to long-term immunosuppressive therapy. So you then have to develop thera therapeutic strategies to allow them to have maybe the two doses and then the booster prior to the 12-month uh, infusion. Another advantage of immune reconstitution therapies, therapies that allow your immune system to recover, is that these kind of vaccines can be given. What is a safe lymphocyte count? I can't tell you because if you look at this curve uh, and the study from uh, Denmark, you can see from about 1.4 downwards, there's a gradual increase in infectious complications related to uh, 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 lymphopenia. And then there's the confounding issues around immunosenescence uh, and the qualitative changes that are not picked up in a total lymphocyte count, like uh, what's happened to the CD8 counts, et cetera. So um, um, a total lymphocyte count is in the eye of the beholder. Also, uh, there are therapies that cause chronic lymphopenia like dimethyl fumarate, and you have to take that into account, similarly with fingolimod. And so you have to wait for these lymphocyte counts to reconstitute before sequencing them onto other therapies that cause lymphopenia to de-risk them. So this is a really important issue in sequencing. And then there's comorbidities and personal factors that need to be taken into account. So there is no simple algorithm that we can apply uh, to customizing uh, disease modifying treatments. So to conclude then, um, I think you have to 
understand the individual's disease. There are issues around the individual drug and when it's been used. And then you have to profile the patient in terms of their own risk aversion, adherence, comorbidities, et cetera, before customizing. And then this has to be layered onto the healthcare system and economic factors. So there is no simple solution uh, to the customized medicine in relation to our disease modifying therapy. So I would like to say that the, although the practice of medicine is an art, not a science, the practice of customized medicine is really an art and not a science. Thank you.